letting me come and spend some time with you. Uh, I'm going to try to make this be interesting that uh, all of you are experts in all of this history. So the things that are written, the things that are online, I'm sure that you already know. So I'm trying to just pick up a few things that you might not find in the written histories. So let us begin. This is the agenda of what I'm going to try to talk about. There's two different uh, aspects of it. One of them is handhelds, and one of them is desktops. And actually, in many regards, they are uh, closely related. So, uh, beginning with the HP 35, uh, everybody knows that history. And so I was going to just uh, go skipping off into it, and I was told, and, no uncertain terms that you can't afford to forget this guy, Tom Osborne. Tom Osborne was uh, up in Wyoming, a university professor, and he's the one that came up with the RPN, the uh, Cordic, the very ideas that made the 9100 work. And he managed to sell that to uh, Bill Hewlett. He had a balsa wood uh, bottle and lots of things to talk about, uh, but uh, he was a good salesman. Got six million dollars for it. Now then, uh, that's a picture of Tom back uh, probably about 1970 or so. That's the way they're remembering. I've talked to him on the phone, and I've done email, and uh, I'm sure he doesn't look like that anymore. <laughs> it turns out neither do I. <laughs> so, this is, uh, in many regards, the basis of the first of the calculators of HP, HP 35. This began in HP Labs, and uh, being as it's HP Labs, but guess what? There's no manufacturing. They don't have a capability of putting something into manufacturing very well. So there was a new division in Loveland. That's just a little bit south of here. And an entire crew uh, transferred from California out to Loveland to do the 9100 and put it into production. So when the HP-35 began, uh, it turns out that there was probably more expertise in Loveland with RPM, the Cordic, the very routines that you find in the HP 35 in Loveland than there was still in Palo Alto. Nonetheless, what was going to come out of it was that the HP 35 was going to be developed in Palo Alto. <coughs> basically HP Labs. I shouldn't say basically, strictly HP Labs. The concept that Hewlett wanted was that I want to have a desktop version just like my, uh, what's in my vest. One for my desk, one for my vest, just alike, except for the uh, printer commands. So, this is how all of this started. Now then, as you, the HP 35 got into production, the desktop was behind, and because it started late, some of the things that had to go into it was a new I.O. chip. The I.O. chip would drive the printer. It had uh, binary uh, arithmetic in it. It had extra registers. It had a number of things. That I.O. chip, by the way, I was a young uh -oh. engineer, and that was, I was the sole engineer on that, so I did do that. Uh, so if you looked at the desktop version, what you found was that there was a simulator, and that simulator had the chips sets that were going to go into the HP 35. It had a great big TTL simulation of the I.O. chip and a 2116 computer uh, simulating the ROMs that were going to go into it. So this is a big thing. Bill Hewlett decided that he wanted to get a demo of what the desktop was going to behave like. <coughs> My boss, a guy by the name of Fred Winninger, uh, was told, okay, you're going to take this to Bill's office and set it up. So the demo is going to be there. Turns out that uh, by that time I was a project manager. 
and he was a section manager. We both had just moved up a week or so before that happened. And I had a technician that took care of the big simulator. You know, it's, it's a big kludge. Something's always dying, and some technician knew how to do it. So I said, Fred, Jim Ray will go with you uh, to California and set it up and make it run. And Fred said, well, the reason that I said that was because he had told me that I couldn't be in the office for the demo. Why? Because I couldn't keep my mouth shut. <laughs> so, you know, when somebody wants to give a demo to a big wig, they don't want somebody else uh, throwing in their interjections. Well, if I don't get to go uh, and see Bill, that's in my technician. And so my boss said, if you were giving the demo and the machine died, would you have Jim Ray working on it or you? I said, well, me, of course. And he said, that's why you're going. So, we, when I say we, uh, it was probably a we that tore it down in Loveland, packed it up carefully so it could go to the airplane and be shipped in the luggage. And then I set it up in Bill Hewlett's office. And uh, I don't get to sit there. Before he's scheduled to arrive, I'm told to disappear. Well, I disappear. But Hewlett's office door, I've never ever seen it closed. Mm. So that meant that once it starts, I can come up and I can sit outside and listen. Well, it didn't take very long to see that Bill, and I'm just going to call him Bill because back then you didn't call him Bill Hewlett or Hewlett. He was simply Bill. <laughs> Bill was not happy. He had been very adamant that these are to be identical machines except for the printer commands. And we had added a bunch of crap in there, and he was getting all upset. Polar coordinates, extra registers, a number of things had been added, and it was, what do you not understand about the same? And I got depressed. If you're going to picture each headquarters, old 1501 page mill. You come in from the front, you go down the center of the aisle, halfway down the building, you turn right, and you get into Bill and Dave's office. Well, you continue, and you go out, and you get into HP Labs. This was back in the early 70s. So I got depressed, went back there to where the HP 35 crew was, and waited. When he came my boss started telling me about uh, how bad it had gone. Well, I knew that how bad it had gone. That was why I was back there. But then, uh, one of the things that happened is that there at the end, Fred smiled and said, but Bill had a solution. Now then, what was that solution? He said, all I want is to have one for my desk, one for my vest that are exactly the same uh, for except for the printer commands. So he happened to like what we thought was going to be the HP 36. And he said, uh, just have a new handheld and take that and strip the printer commands, uh, the printer off of it. And from that is where the HP 45 came. So the HP 45 strictly was. Uh, that meeting, nothing else. There wasn't a bunch of marketing or anything else. This was Bill just simply saying, well, that's what you're going to do. And that was a good idea. And the reason it was a good idea is the 35 started at $395. Uh, that doesn't sound like much to you, but I was a young engineer back then, and $395, I was sitting there uh, at the back of a big meeting setting the price for this. And the price had gone from $135 to $295. And finally, Hewlett stood up and uh, said, I'm running out of time. I'm going to have to leave. You can go on as long as you want, uh, as long as you get to the right answer for the price. It's $395. <laughs> and he walked out. <laughs> Well, uh, it was a collective gasp because everybody knew 
at 395 that's not going to sell. Nobody can afford it. But if Bill says it's 395 the rest of meeting is not on what the price is, but how do you make it palatable? So, uh, what I'm saying now is that by the time the 45 came out, the sales on the 35 were going off because we'd already milked everybody that had 400 bucks uh, for that machine. <laughs> so, this one gets to be introduced at that same price point, 395. Now then, that's going to be happy because the 45 actually is a significantly better machine than the 35. And so at the same price point, that worked fine. And they lowered the price for the 35 down to 295. And uh, so I just wanted you to get an idea of how the 45 came to be and the 46. And this guy is just like that. And the reasoning was that instead of starting with a 35 and making the desktop this way, it was the desktop that made the other one. Yes, sir? I bought a 45. I've never seen a 46. Did it ever get released? Sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 There's, there's one on the sitting right back there. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, Were you sure. serious with my question? Yes. I've never seen a 46. I didn't even, everything I've read, I never saw the back. Well, we yeah. are running out of time now. So, uh, there is a 46. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, just to let you know, this wasn't really the core project. The core project was something called the 9805. And the 9805 was the target from which we knew that we'd be able to pull the desktop version of the handheld down. So if you look at the case, you see that the case is the same, the printer is the same, uh, pretty much the same except for the fact that you have a block. And that block carried uh, the special keys that were going with it, plus it had the ROMs that was going to go with it. So you could get a statistics block, you can get a used car block, you can get this or that. And uh, the best one of them all uh, was canceled because I screwed up and expected to have been fired. I wasn't. And uh, that's a different story I'm not going to relate right now. We don't have time. But I did, after leaving a division manager's office, said to my boss, uh, I expected to be fired for that. And uh, the lab manager was walking in front of the two of us, and he stopped and turned around and said, will you ever do it again? <laughs> and I said, no. And he said, well, I guess we won't have to fire you. <laughs> but you see, that was the old HP. Mm -hmm. uh, so, now then, uh, it turns out that the HP 35, the 45, and the 46 were all in production. The 35 had been around for a long time. The 45 and 46 about the same. And everything was clean. The uh, 35 had an original bug with uh, the logs that everybody knows about. But machines were basically clean. The 9805 goes into production. And we start getting uh, reports back from the field that there's a problem. Well, it's power own problem. They're saying sometimes you turn the switch on and nothing happens. It doesn't wake up. Well, uh, that finally they got me to go out to production and get a bunch of machines and verify that the field was wrong. Well. <laughs> I started clicking it on and off, on and off. It didn't come on. 
Now, how does this happen? Uh, it can't happen because the chipset is, ex is where the parallel sub circuitry is, and it has been the same uh, for thousands and thousands of units. No problem. So how did it happen? The power ohm that's in the desktop version is pretty simple. Uh, all that it did was generate the same power ohm pulse that went to the chipset of the handheld and uh, had an inhibit on the printer so that you had enough time for the machine to wake up and take over and inhibit the printer. You don't want it to go chattering when you first turn it off. So, given that I've designed that, plus the other is perfect, there can't be any problem. <laughs> there was. Started doing it, approximately 10% of the time it wouldn't turn on. Turn it off, turn it back on, everything is fine. And so I started thinking, 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 and all that I can think of is that it's ROM switching because it's, I ran enough experiments that if I look at ROM zero and find how many ROM switch instructions there were percentage wise, it was about the same percentage as failed on the turn on. So I now know it's ROM switching. But that means the 35 and the 45 have the same problem. <laughs> and they've been around for a long time. <laughs> it is. That 1% of the time they fail. Uh, what do you do? Well, it turns out that uh, this is a serious problem. You turn on the switch and nothing happens. That is a serious problem. You can't just leave it, can you? Well, uh, I left a message for the gentleman back in Palo Alto, Dave Cochran. You can find him on YouTube. You can find him in a lot of places. He's been a big uh, contributor. And so I left a message that I'd found a bug in the CMT chip. About 1 or 2 in the morning uh, at home, he called me. and. Uh, <laughs> I told him it was a power on bug, and he says that I was wrong, that there wasn't any <laughs> power on problem, that this had been around forever and ever and never been seen. I told him what it was, and uh, I don't want to shock anybody with what he said. <laughs> it basically was, yes, it's there. He didn't even have to do any experiments. As soon as he knew what it was, uh, he knew it was there. What was it? Well, the power on pulse, the 35 had three ROMs, 0, 1, and 2. The power on pulse forced the ROM selection back to ROM 0, and when the power on pulse disappeared, uh, the address register would go back to 0, and you would begin taking off. But the ROM switch command always followed subsequent. That way you could get the ROM switch and finish whatever computation was being done before it would show up in the next ROM. So if the address register just sitting there freewheeling was going through uh, a ROM switch, it would switch ROMs and it would get lost <coughs> and nothing would happen. The 9805 uh, was a very complex machine, about 10% of ROM zero or ROM switches. That's why we were seeing it. So the question now is, we had a bug that had been around forever. Why did we not see it? Well, I'll tell you why. If you turn the switch on and nothing happens, what are we programmed to do as people? We try it again. And it works. It's only going to be one out of every 10,000 times that it doesn't, uh, that it fails twice. So we thought about it, decided everybody has been seeing this bug for several years. It's been caught thousands of times by customers and nobody has noticed it. We're not going to announce it. We are not going to recall it, but we are going to fix it. <laughs> So that is the unrecalled bug. 
now then. There is something here uh, that you need to think about. You know, I was listening up here, somebody talking about a bug that had been, you know, I think it was USB code for 15 years. Well, uh, very likely somebody has come across and seen that bug before, but it wasn't fatal, and so you endured it. There was some way of getting around it. So, uh, I just, this was one of those funny stories. It wasn't particularly funny at the time, but, <laughs> <laughs> but still, uh, things happen. Yes, sir? We call those stealth updates. That what? We call those stealth updates. Stealth, stealth updates. Oh, <laughs> oh. yes. <laughs> okay, the uh, same division that was doing the desktops that went with the handhelds uh, also had a family of the 9810, 20, and 30. Those three machines. The 9830 had uh, just recently been released. We didn't know if it was going to be uh, a successful product or a failure. It had BASIC in it. It was, in many regards, very different than HP's calculator business. You see, the 9100 was RPM. The 9810 was uh, a souped-up version of the 9100. Uh, in other words, it's the same language, uh, has more registers, it has lots of uh, things that are new and different, but it's still pretty much the same. Uh, 9820 was HP Labs, or HPL, I should say. And HPL it was the HP language. Now then, what was the HPL? The Vice President of R&D was Barney Oliver. Barney Oliver was a well-known scientific and engineering intellectual of that era. And to him, the only way for a calculator to be useful for engineers and scientists is that if you write down a formula, you can take that formula exactly like it is and put it into your machine and you don't have to put asterisks for implied multiply or anything else. If you want 2 pi omega, you can type in 2 pi and there'd be a pi signal and oh, that you maybe you'd use for omega, but it's going to work. So this is what the 9820 was. It was a, the HP language uh, machine. I was going to be the project manager on this, and uh, I'm not going to go through the personnel stories, but there was a certain number of engineers that were available, and they were supposed to be divided between 9825 and 9815. Uh, as it turned out, uh, all of them went to the 9815, the 9825, didn't get any of them. But I was going to be the project manager for that. So I'm all of a sudden in charge of a new machine. The uh, lab manager told me that it's the highest priority uh, project in the entire lab. And it was going to be that way, except for this staffing move, snafu. It's a, it's a different uh, thing. Um, so I'm sitting here with a project and I have no people. So what do you do? There was a marketing engineer, Dick Barney, who was an ex-lab engineer, went up there to do something different and was getting bored. So he was going to be my uh, marketing engineer. I said, Dick, why don't we go out into the field and just try to get some information on the field before we start anything just to define the machine. And he thought that was good. We spent an entire summer out in the field. And what I wanted to do was we'd go to each sales district. We would get the best salesperson in each district and tell that salesperson that we want to make three customer calls. One of them is to a customer that has either recently bought a 9820 or a 9830. I want to go visit them and for them to be a happy customer and to find out why they're happy. I want 
then to visit a customer of a 20 or a 30 who is a recent customer and who regrets having done it. And yes, there are people that buy machines and then wish they'd have done something different. And I also want to go visit a customer that went somewhere else. At the end of that summer, uh, the interesting thing was that we redefined what that machine was going to be. That the original definitions was that it was going to be a 9820 on steroids. That uh, it's going to have language compatibility, it's going to be all of these cool things, and um, whatever. But this summer in the field, we discovered that there was something else that we wanted to do. And it's something that in today's world, you might not even understand. And that the concept of a controller. What is a controller? Well, maybe it's a Raspberry Pi. Maybe it's an Arduino. It's, uh, you know, you have microcontrollers that will do any kind of thing. But if you go back to the middle 70s, uh, if you wanted to control something electronically, you design a specific controller for it, or you got a big-ass computer and uh, did a bunch of programming on it, got I.O. on it to make it work, and you need not just to be a scientist in your field, but you needed to have a computer science uh, capability and everything else, and it wouldn't work. We saw eight twenties uh, out in the field that had such kludges between them and hardware, uh, trying to control hardware, and decided, you know, what we need is to make sure that this device can control people's experiments and hardware. And that's the concept of the controller. And that uh, came out of that summer. And that was one of those good things of going out and talking to your customers. I know that that's rather unusual to ask customers what they want instead of uh, make it and then tell marketing it's their job to sell it. But uh, we did it differently. Now then, this was the early mock-up. You notice that it's keeper function. The keeper function is what we had for the 9820. Now then, why did you have to have keeper function? Well, if you're going to have sign, there will be a button here, the sign. Uh, you want hyperbolic cosine, well maybe it can be a shift uh, sign, or uh, you might have two shift keys. By the time we started adding in all the functions that we wanted, uh, one of the uh, engineers there, the old timer, uh, came over and said, the next thing you're going to have to do is to add a foot pedal in order to get enough shifts <laughs> for that. And uh, unfortunately, that was uh, about true. What we need to remember, though, is that uh, the choice of defining this machine uh, wasn't mine, really. It didn't seem like. This is Barney Oliver. He was, uh, he was quite the engineer, quite the scientist, very, very smart. And uh, when I say that, I'm being very legitimate. He was. Uh, it was always uh, humbling to talk to him technically, that uh, he could humble anyone without even trying. And he detested uh, QWERTY keyboards. He, I think it was probably because he didn't type. That's what secretaries were for back then. And he thought basic was a stupid language. So uh, we're sitting here uh, trying to keep everything happy, basically him, and not have to put a foot pedal down there for shifts. That's me uh, 40 years ago. I'm sorry, I uh, <laughs> haven't held up as well as that 25 back there has. <laughs> that was uh, Chris Christopher, got him, and uh, how I ended up with him. He was uh, on probation at the time that I got him, and ended up uh, retiring from HP, uh, reporting up to Carly, or very close, and so uh, he did all right. 
His wife, well, he's Greek, his wife is Greek, is a wonderful cook, alternate between houses with them trying to wow us with their food, which they did. Chris and I had lots of burning of the midnight oil on this project. And one night about midnight, we made the decision, it's over. We simply cannot do keeper function with this complexity. It's over. So, uh, guess what? I come in and I tell the bosses in Loveland, and are you sure you want to do that? Yes. The old HP was that different positions had different levels of decision. The bosses would try to convince you that you were wrong, but they wouldn't overrule you if it was your decision. And they decided that this was my decision, and they weren't going to overrule me even though it was wrong. But I was going to have to be the one that called Barney up. I called Barney. We, up until then, had been personal friends. <laughs> he told me, uh, I'll be there tomorrow. Well, tomorrow did arrive. Now, this isn't, a, that's a Sabre 60. HP had a new jet at that point in time. Uh, it was a, I couldn't find a picture of it. November 73, Hotel Papa. And uh, he and Ralph Lee, the executive vice president, uh, flew in. Now then, Ralph Lee was a nice guy, but he also had the nickname, the Hatchet Man. Uh -oh. now, then, why did he get the name Hatchet Man? Well, Bill and Dave uh, were decisive. But they didn't want to be called, well, you know what the, you're called if uh, the top guys take the hatchet. So that's what executive VPs are for. <laughs> so here's Barney Oliver and Ralph Lee. We have a high-level meeting there in Loveland, and uh, it boils down to the fact that the Loveland management was going to back me up. That I was wrong, but it was my decision, and Barney had a temper tantrum. He said he was never, ever going to come back to uh, Loveland again. On his way out, he came up, and he was a big guy, almost as tall as I was, and put his head up against me and says, if I fix it, uh, will you keep HPL? And I said, Barney, if you fix it, I'll keep HPL. And the fix was that we couldn't figure out how to do implied multiply. You spell sign, for instance. How do you know S-I-N means the sign function instead of S times I times N? That was the problem. So, uh, guess what? They leave, as soon as they're gone, uh, my boss tells me, you made a terrible mistake for your career. Uh, this isn't good. In fact, you probably have da damaged all of uh, Loveland. But about three hours later, I get a telephone call from Barney. He's at the corporate airport. He didn't even get back to the plant. He's sitting there as soon as he gets off the plane, and he calls me and says, I've got the fix. And. Uh, the whole fix was that functions and uh, control statements are going to be lowercase, variables are going to be uppercase. It seems perfectly simple now, but before we sit there and thought and thought and thought because uh, the old displays always showed everything uppercase. And so we had a mindset that we just couldn't pick that up. Well, and money came up with it, uh, it was going to work. Now I put two stories together on this slide. And my 820 uh, now didn't have to go to basic. It could be software compatible with the 9820. That was one of the key demands that was put onto R&D. That they had lots of software that had been written, especially by customers. And when customers write software for a product, and then you bring a new product, you don't want them to not buy it because they'd have to rewrite their software. You want them to upgrade knowing that they can do their software. So we were supposed to be here. We ended up with a 
division review, and it was Bill Hewlett. Bill Hewlett uh, asked my boss, Fred Langer, uh, have you maintained the compatibility with the 9820? And uh, Fred said, we've uh, really worked and worked and worked to keep that compatibility. Hewlett asked again, <laughs> <laughs> is it compatible? And uh, Fred thought about it and thought about it and said, we have really busted our butts to maintain that compatibility. And Hewlett asked him the third time, yes or no? Turns out that Fred didn't answer with a yes or no. He just simply said, all that we have to show is a bunch of busted butts. And uh, guess what? Hewlett laughed. He said, that's the way engineers always are. They can't hold back adding features. <laughs> and we moved on. So uh, that was one of those highlights where you get a little bit of wisdom from the boss. Yes, sir? Can I, sorry, I just had a question. So how did your customers react to that when you released a, a device that wasn't compatible with retroactively? It turns out that the compatibility was, uh, well, with the I.O. statements, we knew that it was going to have uh, incompatibilities because it had a Mac <coughs> card Right. And the 9025 had a tape. So we knew that that was not going to be compatible. But there were a couple of places where the old HP L language probably was defective. You know, the way that it was put in and just simply decided, we've got to fix it. And it, the, there was a list of exceptions that just simply said, uh, if you do have this statement, it should look like this. And it was a, probably only a half dozen different statements for the entire thing. Now that each one of those could show up multiple times, I admit. And uh, as far as I know, we didn't have any trouble with the customers. So, uh, now I'm going to change uh, a little bit. And what we're going to talk about here is reliability of the product. HP Gear uh, had a reputation of being reliable and robust. We cherished that. That was something that uh, you wanted to maintain. That was part of our reputation. And getting out and defining a new product niche called the controller, you find out that this controller is now basically a single point failure for this big room full of equipment possibly. And if that's the case, you want this uh, single point possible failure to be as reliable as possible. So reliability needed to be a high owner list. Well, I'm not sure how I came up with the name of Dorian Shannon, but uh, he was on the approved list for HP for consultants for uh, reliability. And so I contracted him to come out. He was going to do two things. He was going to teach his normal course, and he was also going to be a consultant uh, on actually looking at the 9825 and our tests and what we were doing and what he thought that we should be doing. Uh, this is the guy. Uh, he, at that point in time, was quite the quality guru. He had a, an excellent reputation. Uh, he was uh, the quality guru for uh, NASA's lunar module, the thing that went down to the moon and came back up. And so as you know, all of them that uh, launched for the moon, or let's say made it to orbit, then down, also came back up. So uh, I think that he gets an A for that. And uh, obviously the other crowning part of his career, whether he realized it or not, was his work on the 25. So, uh, during the day, what was he doing with us? Well, Dorian Shannon was uh, teaching vectored stress testing. Vectored stress testing, you take a particular vector, da, 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 until it breaks, and fix it, take it farther and farther. Vector might be uh, temperature, it might be voltage, it might be this, it might be that. You do 
one vector at a time, then you do two vectors at a time, then you do something else. And so this is what was going on during the day. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't have high hopes because I'd taken these uh, consultants and teachers out to dinner at the steer that uh, Loveland only had one decent restaurant at the time. I don't know, that might still be the case. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but uh, we would go there, and I'd find out that these consultants would say, we don't talk business uh, when we go out to dinner. You have to pay for everything I get, and that's what you get during the daytime. Well, that would mean they only got one dinner off of me, and after that they have to buy their own dinner. Uh, well, uh, during the night, though, this is the rear of the steer. That's what it looked like in 1970. It's what it looks like now. It hasn't changed. <laughs> um, the first night, I discovered that we're going to be here every night. And uh, the reason was Dorian Shannon was different. That uh, go out to eat, and he loved his business. He would talk about uh, the lunar lander. He'd talk about uh, NASA. Uh, he would talk about this product. He would talk about the weaknesses in even the courses that he was teaching. So uh, it was uh, a wonderful time. I'm going to summarize uh, into three rules from what I got out of him at night. Now uh, then, uh, I can't remember what he drank. I always drank Jack and Coke that came out of college, and it hasn't changed. Uh, all I remember from him is that I didn't drink alone. So, uh, rule one, whenever you have new applications, new technologies, new this, new that, there are going to be failure mechanisms that are different than what you've ever had before. These you might call the exotic failure mechanisms. Exotic meaning that your prior testing experience isn't going to catch them for you. And so he just simply said, uh, you will never ever find them that are what customers are for. I know that sounds bad at first, but then he would continue. Nonetheless, 90% of all of your failures will be the dumb, stupid, and preventable failures. So, what does that mean that you should do? Eliminate all the dumb, stupid, and preventable failures and get on with the program. So you might find a few of these exotic uh, new failure mechanisms just by stumbling onto them by accident, but don't waste your time looking for them because you're not going to find them. They are exotic. They will be different. And frankly, getting that out of Dorian Shannon uh, early in my career, uh, I've taken that as the rule. And it's been a good rule uh, that there aren't enough of the dumb, stupid, and preventable things that we uh, try to introduce to customers. That afterwards, we scratch our head and say, we could have found that if we would have look differently. So, uh, that is another one of the stories. Um, I don't know how I'm doing on time, but I'm getting close to the end. What happened was that after the 9025 is into production, and I will go ahead and tell you, it too had a power own problem. And, uh, it was a power own problem that when I found it, I'd been burned by power own before. I didn't delegate it to any of my engineers. And like a good engineering manager, whether true or not, I felt like I was probably the best engineer in the group. So I designed all the power own circuitry myself to make sure it was perfect. It wasn't. It uh, had to be done. <coughs> when over to the production manager and said, stop production. This is serious enough that we're going to have to just halt production until we get a fix. And he said, I refuse. That uh, the only person that I'll listen to uh, for something like this is 
the division manager. And I went to the division manager, told him, and he said, uh, it's a power own problem. He said, I knew that you had that power own problem. I just didn't know how long it's going to take you to fix. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, he had been project manager on the 9100, or let's, maybe lead engineer would be there. And then he had been a lab manager for the 10, 20, and 30. And he knew what had happened with the 9805. Hmm. He said, Don, nobody tells you this, but the truth is, every calculator product that we put out has had to be stopped because of a power own problem. <laughs> so I just presumed that you weren't going to be any different. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, things were there, but after we had that fixed, I'm off working on the 9826, trying to get definitions up for that. And I get a telegram. Now then, uh, some of you may be old enough to remember these yellow pieces of paper that come at you to have a printing on uh, But some of you might not. But I got actually one of these yellow telegrams. It was from Alice Springs, Australia. And it said, uh, if if the machine blows a fuse, does that mean that there is an inherent defect in there waiting to bite us or something of that nature? And so we had a engineer there, Kent Simcoe, who was very, very noisy, but extremely smart in terms of uh, transformers, power, all these kind of things. So I went over and asked him about it. And so he pulled out the a fuse, and he had a jig, and he just put the fuse into it, and plugged in uh, a 9825 and turned it on, and I'd see the fuse uh, jump. You know, in other words, it was a little wire in here at a slight bend, and when I turn it on, it would heat up and expand, and then it would cool down and go back to its shape. And so that meant that every time that you turn this machine on, that you get some metal fatigue in there, and that fuse is weaker than what it was before. And so he said, it's possible that you had a defective fuse. It's also possible, depending upon where the cycle was when you turned it off in the 60 cycle, and where you turned it on, that you can get a surge, and that normally that surge at the worst, isn't going to be enough to blow that fuse. It's not a slow blow. We want it to be a fast. But he said, it's pretty unusual. It might happen. So I sent that information back to uh, in a telegram. I get another telegram back to me, and this new telegram scares me a little bit. I respond with a telegram saying, give me a telephone number. Uh, now then, how did he know it was me? Well, if you go back and get your HP journal, uh, you know, they have articles when there's new products. The 9825 was featured one month. They had a big, nice, beautiful picture of the 9825. You open the first page, it's got my picture, and I have the lead right up for the 9825. So this is why that guy sent the uh, telegram to me. So, uh, I get it, and I call him, and then he tells me, this is going up into a high altitude research balloon. What is the 9025 doing on there? Well, it is controlling the experiment. Uh, how many experiments? Well, it's several. How many of the experiments is it controlling? All of them. It controls the experiments. It does the initial data collection initial data crunching, then it controls the transmitter and uh, sends the data back down to the ground station. So I said, you're telling me if it blows a fuse, everything is off the air. And he said, yes. And I told him, okay, that's an easy fix. You can get a 10 amp fuse <laughs> that will fit in the same uh, slot uh, as that half amp or <laughs> <laughs> and he 
they informed me that they had carefully read the manual and it says under no circumstances is a higher uh, fuse rating or a different type because we wanted it to blow as rapidly as possible if something happened. I told him, look, I was the final editor for that manual and uh, one of the things that we left out was that if it's going up in a high altitude balloon, <laughs> the entire experiment that it should be a 10 amp fuse. <laughs> and he argued with me and uh, I said, look, why do we put fuses? The fuse is such that if something goes wrong, it removes the power before you have more subsequent damage or cause a fire or damage something outside. We're trying to make the repair within the 25 uh, be as minimal as possible without burning it up. We don't want to cause external problems, but you're in a position where that 9825 is in series with everything. It's a single point failure. If it fails, you've lost your entire experiment. So what are you going to lose additionally by putting a 10 amp fuse in there? That, that machine may be dying but it may give you another 30 seconds or another minute or two of data before it's totally gone. And he said, I agree with you. We'll put a 10 amp fuse in it, and I think I'm gonna to have to go back and look at some of my other fusing uh, philosophy on these balloons. <laughs> so, uh, basically what happened was that uh, it got a 10 amp fuse and it flew successfully. <laughs> uh, years later, a TV program I was watching, Nova or something, it was talking about uh, gamma ray research, and uh, it was Alice Springs. It's a big high altitude balloon. The date was just right. There it is. And watch that sucker go up. And I was thinking, there it was. That's the best. What it was all about, it was a one-way trip, but it did uh, add to human knowledge. Now then, uh, I did, uh, before I came here, didn't want to get my foot in my mouth, or somewhere worse, so I checked it. You can get out onto the internet, and if you're careful, you can actually find the date that it went up, and some of the particulars. So. Uh, that was uh, from Alice Springs. It was a one-way trip. <laughs> and as far as I know, uh, IE-25s did a lot of research for a lot of things, including space exploration. But the, that's the only one that I know of that ever made that one-way trip. That's it. When you say it's a one-way trip, it didn't return back to Earth after the experiment completed? Somewhere. 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 Maybe the ocean. Somewhere. Probably the ocean. Yeah. 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 Wasn't Barney Oliver quite an audio aficionado too? Yes. He uh, designed an audio amplifier and uh, made the uh, plans open source and uh, HP Labstock uh, probably funded and built uh, at least a hundred of those audio amplifiers that uh, mm. the old HP philosophy uh, for engineers was that we will furnish the electronics uh, for your home projects uh, as long as they have some semblance of being able to be educational to you and you're never to sell them. In other words, uh, no practical uh, that was uh, acceptable. So uh, that sort of disappeared as the years went by. The labs that I managed uh, clear up until 19 or two, 2003, we operated with that rule. Why? Because it's good for the engineers to do things like that, and I like honest engineers. Mm -hmm. They're going to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, that's all. I hope that you found it interesting.
Go ahead. Why did you use such a cheap rubber on the capstan wheel? Did you think you were using the same that 40 years? <laughs> the question is, why did we use crappy rubber on the capstan for the uh, tank drive? Well, uh, we didn't know that it was going to turn to goo after a few decades. And uh, like you know, there is a replacement. Yes, sir? So what kind of rubber was that? Was it a natural rubber? I have no idea that. Uh, because it's the same rubber everywhere. Everywhere is every county in the nation. Well, it is very difficult to do uh, long term testing. And so, uh, some things. You try to do accelerated testing, and it isn't going to work. Mm -hmm. We did try uh, accelerated testing on all of those, and uh, there is an interesting story about the uh, tape drive. The, we were went through uh, environmental, which is the high humidity, high temperature for X number of hours, and everything worked fine, except that we found out that the tape that was in there would not eject because the housing around it was made of nylon and nylon is hygroscopic that uh, it expands, it will absorb water. We didn't, those of us that were around it thought nylon is impervious to water, but it isn't. It absorbs water and it will expand and so it expanded out where it wouldn't allow it to be ejected. The thing to do was to change to a different material. Now then, it's a precision device and different kinds of plastics will have different ratios of shrinking uh, on different kinds of dimensions. And uh, so it was going to mean it was going to have to be retooled. It was going to be a slip of three, four months for the product. The uh, plastic people there in Loveland, had a department manager, had one engineer, and they had just hired a new engineer, a young lady by the name of Cheryl Caton. And this is a time when the engineers in HP Loveland, she was probably only the second, uh, and Cheryl came to me and said, I've got a better idea that why don't we get a mix of plastics and if I work at it right, I can mix, uh, get a mix that has the same expansion uh, and contraction characteristics. Mm. In other words, the finished product is different from what the tool size was going to be. And she was going to get me something that would be the same <coughs> on all the dimensions. I wanted that. She convinced me that it was going to work. Uh, <coughs> An experienced female that's only been in the company for about two months, female at that, <laughs> overruling uh, experienced plastics guys, they said no. I said yes, and it worked. <laughs> so uh, that was one of those places where uh, that tape drive did get very, very touchy with us. Yep, no, you're just, don't go to a cattle auction. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it.